When we talk about the Taino, few people even know what we're talking about. Everyone knows the Aztec, everyone knows the Inca, everyone knows the Maya. You mentioned Taino and they go, who are these people? The name Taino itself is the generic term for the late prehistoric peoples of, of the Greater Antilles and the Bahamas, the Big Islands, Cuba, uh, Hispaniola, Puerto Rico, and Jamaica. In terms of national identity, the people in Dominican Republic think of themselves as Indians, not as people of African ancestry. These are the people that greeted Columbus. When Columbus arrived in the New World, there were several million Taino already here, living in the Greater Antilles. Knowing more about the Tainos will help us understand that clash of cultures. You have two worlds that didn't have previous knowledge of each other coming together and initially misunderstanding each other fundamentally because they are trying to, to fit them into the world as they understood it, when in fact this was something totally new and un unprecedented. There was a large number of indigenous population of Taino that were decimated, assimilated, or just disappeared within the first 10 to 20 years of contact with the new world. Caves have a very special role in, in Taino culture. They are sort of the way that this world is physically connected to the underworld where the spirits of the dead dwell. The Tainos believed humans were created in two caves. The Taino people came from one cave and all the non-Taino people came from another cave. The Padre Nuestro complex of caverns is really four water-filled caverns and then several others that are land. And it's one of only now nine sites known with early uh, stone materials. When I look at Padre Nuestro, what I look at is its implications for the actual people in the Caribbean, which is one of the last places in the world that was inhabited. So four to 6,000 years ago, we know people came into the Caribbean. The question is, where did they come from? Probably the first wave coming into the Greater Antilles came from the mainland, probably Yucatan, by boat. Came across, inhabited Cuba, inhabited Dominican Republic, and we have evidence of that. The Manantial de la Leta, I think, has a special place among caves and caverns in that it has a very vertical, a direct vertical connection from a watery pool, a watery underworld, if you will, through the surface of the earth to the heavens. And the only way you can explain these objects that date from, oh, 600 years before Columbus contact, right up to the time of Columbus, is that they were offered underwater and they were preserved there in an anaerobic, no oxygen, very little sunlight penetrating, and that's La Aleta. It has the largest diversity of Taino objects of organic and ceramic that uh, we've seen anywhere else, and they were all placed there on purpose. They were all offered to the gods, the inner world. What conception they had of a broader world beyond that, we don't know. Christopher Columbus was not, a, not an accident. His voyage into the New World were the result of many historical processes. By 1492, the last kingdom of Granada is won by the Christians. And it is actually at that point that Christopher Columbus is able to gain the support of Queen Isabella and uh, King Ferdinand for his voyage to the New World. What he was looking for above all was to become the founder of a good family one that would have titles and privileges and renown down through the ages. When we think of uh, Columbus's first voyage, I mean, every, everyone knows Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. He came with the Nini, the, Santa, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. But not everybody knows that the first shipwreck of the Americas was the Santa Maria. And the Santa Maria ran gently up onto a sandbar a reef in present-day Haiti. Well, they couldn't get the ship off the reef, so they had to make a decision. Columbus was not able, with only two small, the two smaller ships remaining, to bring everybody back to Spain. They were able to actually use the materials from, from the now to build a fort called La Navidad. And he left 39 men and he sailed off. Columbus was of, of, the, of the idea that there was a lot of gold in that area. What he wanted to do was to have this fort over there so that they could start the trade with these people. Everyone knew he was coming back. A little over a year later, he comes on the second voyage. <clears throat> he arrives at Navidad. What's he find? Smoldering timbers. Everyone's dead. There was a doctor with the group 
who said they looked like they'd been dead about two weeks. Columbus was thinking about trade, but the Spaniards were thinking about colonization. They actually started to demand some things from the indigenous people, and indigenous people just did not accept that. Most probably it was the local Tainos who, who essentially finally decided they had to get rid of these people because they were too disruptive. So he knows not to stay there. He elects to go down the coast where he had sailed a year prior in a matter of several days. It takes him 30 more days to make it 80 miles down the coastline. And he pulls into a place, a river, the Bajo Nico River that he had named. And he says, this is it. This is the settlement of Isabella. They brought a, uh, a priest, they brought some women, they brought animals, they brought everything they need for a full-fledged colonization. The, the sort of backbone of the early Spanish colonial economy was the right to make demands on the labor of the Tainos. If a Taino did not want to accept Christianity, that person could, could be enslaved. One of the major sources of the writings of Father Las Casas. He had seen actually in, uh, in Cuba rivers of blood, you know, of, of all the indigenous people that were um, killed a massacre in the hands of the Spaniards. They overworked the Tainos in the gold mines and the, the Spanish plantations. They took them away from their villages and their families at crucial points of the agricultural year. From then on, we're going to see that there's going to be a major um, clashes, uh, actually, in which many um, Spaniards actually died at the hands of, of the Tainos. The trigger, at least as, as the story has come down to us, was when a Spaniard cut off a Taino's ear on a trumped up charge of theft. The Spanish show up with hackbutt rifles, crossbows, horses with uh, soldiers with lances. But I would say that the most important weapon against the indigenous people was actually disease. There are accounts of at least some Tainos uh, killing their children and then committing suicide rather than trying to face a world in which they could no longer cope. The annihilation of the uh, the, the culture of the Taino and right in through the, uh, uh, the Americas is well documented. A small amount of Spanish made huge influence because of their arms and their weapons and their tactics. They were there to conquer. They were there to make a conquest. If you look at the major transformations in human history, and I don't care, you know, give me a list of a short list, 5, 8, 10, 12, I don't care how many. You have to include in that list the unification of the old and new worlds into a single world. After that, everything is different from the way it was before. People, plants, animals, diseases, ideas start moving all over the world in this sort of first great sweep of globalization, a word that's much bandied about nowadays. But the real globalization first occurs at the end of the 15th century. In a sense, they are the first people in the path of the hurricane. And they deserve our, our study and respect for that very reason. <laughs>